home this week to visit my mom. And while I was there, the immediate family gathered for a meal because I don't get home to Canada very often, and we really wanted to have time to visit with each other. Now, whenever we plan this simple meals, there's always the question of whose house it's going to be at, and which daughter is bringing which menu item, and who's going to bear the brunt of the cooking. But in my family, we get along quite well, so there's not actually that much friction. But in many families, that's when the tension starts, isn't it? There's always somebody in the family who thinks that they are the chief organizer, and they want to they want everything to be nailed down. They want to know who's bringing what, when, where, how, why, right? And there's somebody else who's very detail-oriented, not the chief charge person. They want to make sure that, for example, in my family, that there's no peanuts at all at the party, right? And there's going to be someone in the crowd who's more laissez-faire, and they have no idea why you're upset when, you, when they don't RSVP, or when they show up at the very last minute with peanut butter cookies as they're offering. Some of that family sibling rivalry and family tension is found in today's scriptural story, but there are also other many other layers of meaning that we're going to explore. In her article in the Huffington Post, Sister Carol Perry described the scene like this. It was a lovely afternoon on the hill village of Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem. It's a delightful place to visit because the breeze can be caught there as opposed to the valley all around. But Jesus goes there for more than the breeze. He goes to visit because that's where Martha and her sister Mary and her brother Lazarus live. He knows and seeks their friendship. So this day, as the family of Bethany looks out down the road, they see Jesus coming with his disciples. And they know that there's going to be a good time for conversation and for food and rest before the group heads on to Jerusalem. So after a flurry of greetings, Martha goes off to organize the meal because in a world without cell phones or even refrigerators and no expectation of being able to order out, guests can cause a bit of a stir. <coughs> True to her understanding of her place in the first century world, Martha goes to produce a meal for the hungry people, and she looks out towards the gathering, and she sees her sister Mary just sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is a problem, but it's not the problem that you might think. In the first century, sitting and listening assumes the posture of a disciple. And Mary has chosen to do what women simply do not do. Only men could be disciples of rabbis. In fact, there was a common sentiment in the first century that said it was better for the Torah to be burned than to be placed in the hands of a woman. And every morning when men, when men woke up, they prayed with thanks to God that they were not born slaves, Gentiles, or women. So, for Mary to sit at the feet of Jesus just like any other student of the great rabbi was scandalous. And for Jesus to commend her was simply incredible. And what Jesus said back to Martha was less reprimand than it was for an invitation for her also to come and hear. Jesus was always breaking down or breaking through those barriers, inviting everybody to know God better, to know the Lord's comfort and healing and power <clears throat> and guidance. You know, there's over a hundred names for Jesus in the Bible. 
It's a, simply an experience that you cannot live without. And that was what he was inviting her into. Now you note that he never tells her to stop working. He encourages her to give up her worry and her distraction and her distress and instead find serenity in him. But he doesn't rebuke her for serving. In fact, the book of Luke puts a priority on serving. Today's scripture passage immediately follows the story of the Good Samaritan in which the one who shows mercy and rescues the, the victim by the roadside is the one that is named <coughs> the good neighbor. And at the end of the parable, Jesus' recommendation to all of us is to go and do likewise. So being busy isn't wrong. But elevating service over spirituality isn't right either. If we think that Jesus is just more interested in haunt cuisine than the bread of heaven, then we're off track. We need both service and worship and prayer and study. <coughs> we need people who will cut the grass and people who will lead Bible studies. <coughs> we need people to coordinate new flooring or coordinate the church projects and people who will take the bulletins home, flip them over to the back and pray for all those people that need to be held in the light. We need people to assemble backpacks for children in need and to host movie nights and to teach our children and to look after them in the nursery and to gather here on Sundays for worship. We don't have to interpret this passage as one sister or the other or practice versus presence or duty versus love or doing versus being. Mary and Martha are sisters. They are a complementary set. Each can find a way of using her unique gifts and find peace in Christ. Both listening and doing, receiving God's word and serving others are vital to the Christian life. Just as inhaling and exhaling are vital to breathing. Yet, how often do we forget to take a deep breath? Trying to serve without being nourished by God's words is like expecting fruit from a tree that's been uprooted. So, when was the last time that you became still and listened and breathed in God? I'm not quite talking about rattling off grace before dinner or shooting off those prayers at a red stoplight. We do those things, it's, it's good. It's good to be in conversation with God all day long. But when did you ever turn off your cell phone, turn off your computers and TVs, and take time just to be with God? In our busy world, we so often define ourselves by what we can achieve at work, in school, in the community, and in our homes. Every Sunday mor morning, sorry, even Sunday morning worship can become an obligation and a mark of duty when we only measure who is present in the pews and we don't celebrate God's presence with us. When we take time to breathe in God, we <coughs> breathe in the spirit of peace and we find renewal. We remember who we are, that we are children of God. So, when I go to visit my mom, whether it's in Florida or Ontario, and I put my little head on her pillow, I always sleep well. I, I lay down and 
I don't know anything until about 6.30 the next morning, which is a rarity, isn't it? Yes. It's not because my mom's bed is more comfortable or her pillow is fluffier. It's because I am in the presence of my mom, my mommy. I am a full-grown woman with children and grandchildren. But I grow stronger and more rested when I'm in my mom's home. And that's how it is with God's love. There's nothing that we can do to earn that love. And there's nothing that we can do to prevent us from getting that love. But we can take time with God to grow in God's strength and rest in Christ's <laughs> peace, and maybe even find renewal in the spirit for our work. So breathe in God's love. The how of that moment varies from person to person. So for example, I like to walk. I know you like to play tennis. When I walk, I am out in, on the route a few minutes, and I walk into the shade of the trees. It feels like I'm walking into a cool embrace by God, and that's when I relax and rest and just give myself over to the moment. And Frank runs, and some runners, after they've been out for a mile or two, they'll find that their pace and their breath start to unite, and they get to moving and not even thinking about where they're moving. They become in the zone. And often cyclists do this too. Sometimes though it's not when we're out doing physical activity. Sometimes it's like when I'm washing the dishes. That warm water and that routine task just open my mind and heart to God. So, from the slip of papers that I gave you earlier, what is it for you that helps you to connect with God? Being here Sunday morning. Being here on Sunday morning. Very good. All the time, mostly when I'm still. Mostly when you, was that you or your husband? Not me. Does he even get still? He don't get still. No. <laughs> <laughs> what else? When you're doing good things. When you're serving, when you're doing good things. When I see or hear my brother. <laughs> you're, you, I can feel God. You can feel God through your brother. For some, it's when they do things with their hands. So for our knitters and crocheters who make the prayer shawl, that's their time. There are several prayer practices that people engage in intentionally, like centering prayer or saying the Jesus prayer over and over again until your mind lets go of your worry and you become one with God. Painters and woodworkers can get lost in their creativity. Some people who are up at night with a small child, whether you're feeding that small child or whether that child is sick, you have a choice of being frustrated and nervous because you're up, or you can walk with that child in God's presence. Many others connect through scripture. They'll read one passage of scripture over and over again, letting each word come slowly to their mind and finding that some of those words are like bumps in the road that cause them to slow down and go off and explore how that scripture can be more meaningful to them. Sometimes you're not reading the same piece over, but you're just working through the Bible, and that scripture means something to you, new, something new to you that day. Some people do use their phones and computers, and the apps come up, and they read the scripture, and in that moment, that particular scripture has meaning, extra meaning just for them. And for those who wake and don't feel joy when they open their eyes and feel only a dread, just breathe. Exhale worry, 
and breathe in God's love. Exhale fear and breathe in Christ's peace. Exhale anger and breathe in the Spirit's hope. Just breathe. Jesus invites all of us who are worried and distracted by many things to sit and rest in his presence and to hear his words of grace and truth and to know that we are loved and valued as children of God. And for those of us who are more like Mary, we need to know that service is also worship. And for those of us who are more like Martha, we need to remember that worship is also service. Each of us can find a way for the still speaking God to get a word edgewise in our busy, distracted life. And a lot, each of us can find a way to allow the Spirit to breathe freely in us and renew our lives. I invite you this week to take time to be with God. Amen.